we enter this particular journey really hoping that you know, why shouldn't our 18-year-old apprentices be the next leaders of this studio in due course? Episode 156. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I am speaking with Jason Gein and James Ewan of APT. So Jason started his career at Ellis Williams, where he worked on the Sterling Prize nominated Baltic Centre for Contemporary Arts. And then he worked at Stanton Williams and YRM before joining APT in 2011. At APT, Jason is a director, studio leader and a member of the board. He has been instrumental in the development and growth of the company to an employee ownership trust in 2018. And he provides strategic direction, design overview across the practices portfolio projects, encompassing several sectors and typologies and scales. Jason is an active member of the London arts scene, having recently completed 10 years as a trustee of several arts-based institutions. He also has been a board member of the Bloomsbury Festival and was recently invited to join the esteemed jury for the Architecture Master Prize in 2021. James joined it apt in 2013. He's a trustee board member, project leader, and he contributes to the strategic development of apt and its culture. He has overseen some of the practice's largest projects, including a 17 and a half acre Fulham Gasworks master plan, which creates a new residential community, which is delivering almost 2000 homes. His extensive experience spans overseeing projects within several different sectors, typologies and scales. He's recently completed a 400 and 550 uh, Longwater Avenue, um, which is an enormous twin office building in Reading, which was designed to achieve a Bream excellent rating as well as building standard and platinum certification. In this episode, Jason and James give us a real insight into their company structure. What is an employee-owned trust and how the shift from traditional to EOT re-energized the studio and has provided an environment that attracts, retains, and incentivizes employees. They also share their commitment to facilitate change in the industry and how their own rebrand reflects the values of the firm that is now apt. And they also discuss a very um, important apprenticeship scheme um, and how apt has has been encouraging the new growth or the growth of, of new architects and how they are cultivating talent, which is really, really exciting. And I was uh, super pleased to hear that. So sit back, relax and enjoy Jason Gein and James Ewan. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. James, Jason, welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. How are you both? Very well, thank you very much. And we're delighted that you're having us uh, for this discussion. Excellent. Good morning, there. Great. So you're both um, directors, project leads at APT, formerly known as Robinton, Robin Partington. Um, your careers, you've been involved in numerous projects, um, and it's quite exciting to be able to speak to both of you. Um, I suppose the first question we can, we can jump into is, how would you both describe your roles within APT, and how did you come to be at APT? Right, okay, this is, <laughs> this is where we find uh, our rhythm here as to not talk over each other or to dive in at the wrong position. Okay, so... Um, my name's Jason and I'm an architect and I've been with APT, as we now are, for 11 years. Um, my journey here uh, began working with Robin way back yonder when we were together at uh, Austin Palmers. Goodness, I think Robin was my boss back in the early 90s. Um, we got back together again when we were both um, heavily immersed in the project that was Hamilton's. And ultimately, we came to be here together. Uh, it's been an 11 year journey for me. I've known Robin, as just said, for 25, 30 years or more. And I think as we sort of 
go through this sort of uh, conversation, what you'll find is that a lot of what this business is about is friendships, um, predominantly about sort of having fun together and people who trust each other implicitly and come together to explore creative ideas. So that's ultimately how I came to be at APT, um, basically following a chum in Robin and working together here with Robin. In terms of my role, uh, I was previously known as a studio leader with Robin. Uh, Robin and I ran the business mm -hmm. and actually just had a sort of restructuring of the business, whereby James and I are now exec directors of the business and run and manage the business. So that's my particular journey here over the last 11 years. James? Um, so I, um, I've i got a number of years on Jason, <laughs> which I'm sure he'll be blasted in if we can say. I worked at a number of uh, practices, both large and small in London. I was at Raphael Vignoli for nearly four years there, um, working in Oxford um, on the Mathematical Institute. And I actually knew one of the project architects here at the time. Uh, and uh, they introduced me to Robin some nine years ago. And uh, I, I'd, I'd seen Robin sort of set up the practice from afar. And I admired the fact that he'd uh, done so during a, a pretty tough period. It was a, we were in recession at the time and, and mm -hmm. Robin had, you know, struck out and and, and I, I admired that. And so, um, Kasia introduced Robin to, to, to and, and I, and um, I, I came here for an interview, and um, and the rest, as they say, is history. But uh, you know, it, it, it was one of those again, one of those um, sort of meetings where it's it's a friend of a friend, and and you you you, you know you 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 get together, and and we had some strategy. He, he was he's a very energetic guy, uh, is Robin, and um, you know. I just thought, yeah, why not? You know, this looks like a really great place to work. And um, I've, I've been proved right. Amazing. And and so you're both actively, so you're both board members. or And, 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 and I presume that's the, the equivalent of directorship, where you're involved in the strategic decisions of the business and the financial decisions and client acquisition decisions. Is that, would that be correct? Yes, that's right. Um, yeah, so... Uh, we have a we have an interesting structure to the business um, as an employee and trust, and uh, James and I are both directors of the business, and um, you know with a wider circle of uh, managers within the business, we all work together to manage the business. Um, it is interesting the structure of an employee and trust, and I'm sure we can come on to that uh, very shortly in that you know, we run this business on behalf of everybody. Mm. Everybody here in the studio is an owner. Right. And in a sense, part of our role is the governance of that ownership on behalf of everybody to steer the business to be successful on behalf of everybody. And if we go all the way back to 2009 when Robin set up the business as Robin Partington Architects, Breaking out from previous lives and where we had previously been, one of the key objectives at that time was to ultimately get to an ownership structure where everybody was vested in it mm. and see a career path in it. And um, I think one of the things that makes me most proud about the business is the, well, the stability and length of tenure of the people here within the business. And you know, if we sort of dissect that, you can take that, I believe, all the way fully back to people believing that there is a career path here for them. Yeah. Which is important in a discipline like architecture. And and how did the business move into becoming employee ownership? What does it what does that mean? What are some of the mechanics behind it? <clears throat> well the, the the practice was set up as a traditional limited company. Um, and we, uh, there was a, you know, there was a collective decision to um, move to an employee ownership trust, um, as, as Jason's already said, to give 
uh, employees a sense of ownership um, to to help them feel invested in 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 the practice that they are part of. We've always been a practice that um, has tried to create a really enjoyable environment for staff. Um, for, for staff to actually enjoy coming to work. We've won Sunday Times best place to work, you know, on, on more than one occasion. Um, and actually when we interview new staff, you know, they've, they've heard from friends and colleagues and peers about, oh, we've heard that act is, is, a, really, is a really good place to work, which, which we're really, really proud of. Mm. And I think collectively we felt that, that, that by moving to an employee ownership trust sort of sat with that, environment that we were creating you know that people enjoy working here and therefore um wouldn't it be great if they had a had a stake in in the practice um so um it involved uh as you would imagine uh, getting involved with specialist lawyers to actually migrate practice from a limited company to the ownership trust and what we have is um, we've already talked about how the, 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 the practice is managed and governed on a day-to-day -day basis by Jason and I and others in the studio, but we also have a trustee board, um, a, a series of non-exec directors uh, and individuals who are able to help us steer the practice for the benefit of everybody that's, that's employed here. So, so we, we've got our we've we've got a sort of two layer structure, if you like. We've got we've got the day to day management of the practice, and then we have expertise, you know, um, uh, from from other parts of the industry who can actually help us make really key strategic decisions for the next three to five years and and, and the direction of of the studio. So these are. Com completely outside non-execs that come in and they and act as act as advisors essentially yes yes indeed um so we have what we call an operational board which is working on behalf of the studio close to the studio know the ins and outs and the machinations of the studio uh then the share the one individual share belongs to the trustees right. these are non-execs they come from a, an architectural and property background. Mm -hmm. uh, we have three of them. And uh, ultimately, they provide the ultimate level of governance, making sure that the ops board don't go rogue, don't do silly things. And they're there to make sure that actually that shareholding on behalf of everybody is managed correctly. So I sit on the operational board uh, with Robin and others. We report to the trustees. James sits on the trustee board. Mm -hmm. And ultimately, we report to the trustees to make sure that we're doing things correctly. Um, it's a great structure, really, because what it does is it protects architects from being predominantly the appalling business people that we can be at times. <laughs> uh, you know, we want to pick up a pen and talk about design and creativity and all of these sorts of things. But I guess the business of architecture isn't really discussed a lot mm -hmm. within architectural studios. And this particular structure enables us to go to the best in class from a managerial expertise to turn this business creativity and how we manage it into something which is really well structured mm. and governed. Um, and we've enjoyed it. It's taken a, a little bit of time for us all to find our place within the relationship. But I'd like to think that here we are four years and more now. It's really sort of purring like a, uh, a really you know, well-ran sort of um, sports car. Brilliant. What what have some of been the major changes in terms of the business operations that have taken place since this shift into the uh, employee ownership structure? What things have been have, have really kind of improved? Would you say? Well, I think I think um, what we've got now is a structure where people can take responsibility or do take responsibility for aspects of the business, which I think. Previously, it was more of a traditional model where you had <clears throat> Robin in his role as director and, and founding yeah. partner. Um, and it was, it was a very sort of, you know, traditional top-down structure in that respect. 
um, it worked very well. But I think but what we what we have now is the ability for um, studio members to take ownership of certain aspects of the business. So we've got a, first of all we've got a much wider management team. So there's Jason and I here, but we also have a series of other project leaders who um, are contributing to aspects of, of the direction of the practice. And that's across all aspects of the business, from the clients that we want to work with, the sectors that we'd like to work in, um, you know, finance, our insurance policies, our you know, quality control, those sorts of things. Um, we've got we've got multiple contributors mm. to to, um, to 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 how the practice is operating, but also importantly, we've got other things that um, that we have a we have a group called Forum, which is made up of a cross section of members of the practice, and the idea of that group is to to discuss and bring things to the attention of the wider management team. Of things that that you know staff feel are important, and 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 they have an opportunity to voice those um, uh, issues and put them on the table, and, and and to have a discussion. and And if we think collectively that there is a, a seed of a good idea, then we can we can affect those changes to to ensure that that we're doing things that ultimately our our employees want to see within the business. I, I, I can. I can give a good example of that where we, a few years ago, we, we rewrote our, our parental policies, you know, maternity and paternity leave, because that was something that we had a few expectant mothers within the practice and yeah. a few uh, expectant fathers, and, 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 it, and it became a really hot topic. And it was something that was clearly important to people. It wasn't that, that we... we um, we didn't feel it was important, but it was something that was probably, you know, on a list of 100 items, it was probably halfway down the list. And so it was their opportunity to bring that to the fore and actually table that as something that they saw as really important as a priority at that time. And we were able to action that, rewrite the policies, you know, uh, improve the conditions. And that, and that was a really successful demonstration of how, you know, it, it can work successfully. <clears throat> So how, how does the um, ownership actually work? So sort of technically, does, is the company then split up into shares? And then how do those shares get distributed? Do people have like an equal, uh, people able to invest their own salary if they want to have more ownership? Or is there limits to how much you're allowed to own? No, it's, it's actually much simpler than that. And it's something that we're really, really proud of in that this is one of the rare occasions, I think, where we've set up an employee-owned trust. It's quite a hot topic. I think within the creative industry, there are a number of employee-owned trusts now. But I don't know many that are like ours, which is 100% employee-owned trust. I know of examples where 51% still belongs to governing partners right. and 40% to the employees. Well. That's not really, dare I say it, an employee-owned trust in that there is still that 51% within the ownership and governance of founding partners. Mm. So I think one of the exceptional things that we did here, working with Robin, who was fully on board from day one, which was to navigate a way where the employees, the shareholding, could purchase the business from Robin over a 10-year tenure so that Robin ultimately um, is in a position where that purchase has been facilitated, but ultimately the shareholding has moved completely into the ownership of this one particular share, which is managed by the trustees. So James and I and everybody else, we don't actually own the business per se in terms of salary sacrifice or anything like that. The abstraction here is that one share sits, has been purchased, and Robin still remains a member of the business, which is so important to us. Right. You know, here he's fully vested. He is enjoying what we're doing together. Yeah. And that 
ultimately has been part of the brilliant journey that we've gone on. Um, why did this begin? It began ultimately because I think a number of us have come from firms where that thorny topic of succession has never been fully addressed. And by doing it this way, people can see a career path. You know, James can see a career path where he's moved from being a project leader through now to being an exec director. You know, our other project leaders can see career paths. Our project architects can see how they can progress to become project leaders and ultimately board members. And I think that's just such an important thing in terms yeah. of retaining that that glass ceiling about ownership is broken because here we are in one of the most expensive cities in the world. You know, we, architectural salaries aren't particularly uh, generous in that wider world of things. Mm -hmm. You know, when lawyers and people that can purchase a shareholding and sort of retire to the golf course and things. So, it's a way where you can become an owner and a leader without actually having to sacrifice, you know, sort of salaries and things like that. It's, it's down to talent, really. It's about to enthusiasm and commitment to the wider cause of the project that is apt. So we're really thrilled about what the EOT has done for us in that it's given us this sort of unusual position um and uh, we're excited you know, we're enjoying that sort of uh, part of the journey together how, how, how does it how does it impact the way that um the board communicates say things like financials to the rest of the staff or the employees because often there's a you know one it's really interesting what you're saying here about having everybody involved and in removing this glass ceiling and you know one of those things that often remains in place um is you know a, a kind of people not knowing what's happening on the business side or the business health, if you like. Is there a high level of transparency that, that you guys engage with, with, the, with everybody in the team? Uh, there is. So um, we enter every year. Um, we have a retrospective about how the business has performed over the past 12 months. And also we communicate the business plan to people. So... What are we looking to achieve? What, what projects are we targeting? What sectors are we targeting? Um, what is our current portfolio looking like? You know, in terms of you know, how many projects are we going to have on site? How many are going to be in planning? How many are going to be, you know, detailed design stages? Which are the sort of avenues that we're pursuing? But also how that translates into income mm -hmm. and profitability. Um, we share what it co costs to run the studio so people are aware in, in, in terms of, you know, if we're, we're able to deliver on those costs, fixed costs, and, and we're able to deliver on income, people then very quickly understand, okay, there's, this potentially could be a, a, a profitable year. Um, and then what we do is we have a, um, a monthly practice catch-up where we discuss a whole manner of things. But part of that monthly catch-up is how is the practice performing against the targets that we set at the beginning of the year? You know, are we up, down, um, or indifferent? And, and, and people are there for understanding of where we sit against that original plan. Yeah. And hopefully... When and I think I think we've demonstrated this in 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 times where it it has been a bit tough, you know, in and particularly in the last couple of years, you know, it, what, what the whole um, world has had to go through, but particularly our industry, which is which can be quite up and down. Yeah. Um, you know, we're able to communicate to people that we need to pull together at the moment, or we need to be a little bit more flexible in the way that we're working at present, or you know, with the projects that staff are associated with, because actually they might need to cover a few gaps here and there because we've got chasing new things or a project is slowing down or a project is ramping up. Mm -hmm. And so, so people are, are sort of taken on that journey throughout the 12 months of, of really what, what, what the health of the practice is and, and how they can help get us through 
busy times, but also get us through some not so busy times. Um, and I think it's about sharing information fundamentally. I mean, people can't react to these things unless they know what's going on. And um, I think there's a tendency within architectural practice to not share that information, to actually hold that information close to, you know, director's chests and, 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 and therefore it creates quite often uncertainty, you know, and, and um, you know, it, it, it's not a healthy thing. So we, we believe that by sharing information, it helps, it helps the, the, the staff understand the state of the business and, and, and to react accordingly. And then just, just picking up on that, in the, in the demonstration of what the business plan in the year, look ahead for the year is, we can actually set the thresholds for if we can exceed or get to these targets, mm-hmm. we will be profitable. By being profitable, we can then reward via dividends and bonuses the generous endeavours of the staff. So people can ultimately see that their hard work is not just rewarding to a fair, sensible and generous salary, but we're going that extra bit and therefore we are being remunerated associated with going that extra bit. Yeah. Um, it's actually written into our constitution. You know, we have a practice handbook, of course, etc. But we also have what we call call the three apt core values. Um, the first two are sort of associated with that thing about architecture, which is design standards being consistent, pushing creative boundaries, nurturing creativity. But our third core value is quite unusual for an architectural business, which is being profitable enough to reward everybody. Mm-hmm. And that's that's sort of sensible business governance in a sense, you know. And we don't talk about it enough in architecture. We're so keen to pick up the pen and to draw and be brilliantly creative. And this is very much a studio that endeavors to do that. But equally being uh, fiscally solvent, uh, making profit and rewarding our staff. You know, that's that shouldn't be a you know a non-discussed topic. Mm. And I think that is something that we do well here within the business. I love I love that. I love I love the fact that you've got profit, profit, healthy profit, ethical profit as one of your core values. That is very unusual to see that in, in an architect's practice. And dare I say it, you know, in the troubling last couple of years, with movement within the portfolio, project starting and stopping, you know. We're able then to communicate to the staff that we're not going to let anybody go. We're actually going to sacrifice a certain amount of profitability this year, if not all, to retain staff, to invest that into fallow periods within the business cycle. Yeah. And again, that's an important part of an EOT. You know, we're all in it together. Um, you know, we've we managed to navigate all of this without sort of redundancies and furloughs and all of that sort of thing. And it's predominantly down to being open about the fiscal performance of the business and how we've invested in the staff here, rather than that often seen model, senior partners on the golf course and rewarding themselves, yeah. rather than thinking about part ones, part twos, architects and everybody else. Yeah. So, you know, the DNA thread of the studio is it's about the people who are in the studio and for the people. Mm-hmm. Um, one of these, the, the, the values in the constitution, was this something that existed right from the outset when it was robbing Partington architects or was this something that kind of emerged along with the transition into employee ownership? And I'm assuming that the rebrand as well from Robin Partington to APT was also part of this transition. Exactly right. So um, when Robin set up RPA and then RPB subsequently with the A from architecture transforming to partner or partners, you can begin to see that emerging change. Um, and we set off on that journey together and you know, we wanted to get it done in five years. And and that was a core part, actually, of when this business was set up. Can we transition to an ownership for everybody within five years? It took slightly longer. I think it took seven and a half for us to get there. 
But what we did when we got to that point and that journey to that point, you know, we took all of the good things from what RPA and RPP represented, mm -hmm. and we also saw it as a reset of what were the things that we couldn't quite and didn't quite achieve, and how can we now tie them into the new constitution of the business? Um, having got to the point where the constitution could change, then it seemed very logical that we no longer, and with, you know, I come back to it, Robin's absolute 100% consent. You know, if we're going to rebrand or become an EO team, why do we need an individual's name above the door associated? Yeah. And then came up with apt, you know, this short, sexy, pithy little word that means so many things. Um, and that just seemed the absolute opportune moment, you know, the ownership has changed, therefore let's rebrand and change the name of the business as well. We also went one better. I mean, goodness, we, we just, well, we had a success, an enormous success with a wonderful client of ours, Royal London, where we were previously in Castlewood House, a rather sort of tired 1950s building on New Oxford Street. Uh, we were the architects in getting a great planning consent for that building for our client. Ultimately, it made us homeless, a nice problem to have as an architectural studio. And here we were four years ago, changed the constitution and ownership, changed the brand and the name, and also moved at exactly the same time. And um, that's ultimately how we've ended up here in Clark and Well in a, a wonderful studio. So uh, it, was a, it was a busy year, 2017. It's sort of... Uh, get married, move house, and have kids all at the same time. And um, I'm not sure I want the name, but, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a very good What was the process for choosing the name? Because it, it is a really cool-looking name. It, as you said, it means so many different things. Like it's a great looking logo. It's just simple. It's it's a it's kind of quite smart. What was, was that an internal thing, or did you work with, with branding consultants? Uh, we're, we're not that clever. <laughs> so, so we worked with the absolute best uh, in a, a company called Greenspace, who are fabulous friends of ours, and they went on a journey with us. It took about oh, between four and six months, I think. Uh, they got underneath, first of all, the business and who the business is and what we want it to be. I mean, we thought the rebrand to a studio would be naively. Ah, let's get together in a room and we'll exit two hours later with a name, a logo, and we're all going to be happy. Well, brilliant people who know how to do this sat with us and sort of said, no, we'll get to that bit. But first of all, you know, what are your values? What is the constitution? What you... And we went through all of that. And it was really great because it sort of, you think you know it. You think you know what you want to be and the journey that you want to go on, but you only partially know it. And it only comes from collective discourse and sharing that better things emerge. And what you felt was the journey becomes an alternative mm. journey, which is richer. Mm. And we went on that with green space and eventually we got to what does the business want to achieve? And then we moved on to what could the name for the business be? And um, goodness, there were some hair-raising moments. Um, some of the names <laughs> that were sort of put onto the wall, some of the things that were being discussed, some of the things that we thought were good ideas. And then on a Friday, you reflect and you say, yeah, that's definitely nailed it. And come Monday, you think to yourselves with your colleagues, what on earth were we thinking? <laughs> um, and, you know, the great navigation of that is down to the expertise of our friends, Greenspace, who helped us on that. Act, it was a really, the final choice. When we saw it, we knew it. And, you know, the project leaders, the studio leaders, there was six, seven, eight of us all involved in that process. We were all asked to sort of circle what we felt were mm -hmm. the best of words, and we all sort of went predominantly to the same. What a change. But what confidence in the shape of that word, 
what it looks like represents the multiple connotations of it. Yeah. Um, the biggest journey has been actually getting people to understand that it's apt, not APT. Having come from RPA and RPP, the first piece of messaging has been to, so what does APT mean? Who are the initials and the owners of APT? And so um, that's taken a little bit of time. I think that whole process, though, was, was very interesting um, because we, we ended up with what we believe is a fantastic result in, in terms of branding and, and our, you know, just our, our graphics and our, our website. And, you know, Green Space really, really sort of took us through that whole journey. But also, I think importantly for me, it, it raised some really pertinent questions about what, what kind of practice do, do we want to be? Mm -hmm. um, you know, to that point, um, we had largely been under um, Robin's stewardship and and rightly so um, because he, he set the practice up, was the founding member. But I think um, collectively the sort of seven or eight people that were involved in that rebranding process, you know, we've come from all different architectural walks of life. You know, we've all worked at different practices. We've not been one of these studios where everybody has come out of a predominant, you know, practice. We're not all out of Foster Partners. We're not all out of Rogers. You know, they're, 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 there's 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 quite a lot of diversity in 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 our architectural education and profession. You know, our professional path. And I think going through that process helped us collectively come to some quite crucial decisions about what kind of practice do we want to be. Um, and, and so I guess, you know, that, that, that was a really um, important part of that process and almost a sort of a, a, a spin-off, if you like, because Green Space took us through all of these questions and, and raised, you know, things that we hadn't really thought about before. And, and I think that's helped us, you know, steadily over this past four years, you know, really understand who we are and what we want to do. Yeah. And that all came. That, that's branding exercise. Love it. Can you tell us a little bit more about the contents of the constitution? Like what is, what is this document? How did it come about? Was this something that got a kind of refresh during the rebranding? Yeah. So, I mean, basically uh, everybody who joins the business day one, they, you know, they sit there introduced to everybody, et cetera, et cetera. We, you know, so far, so good. But actually, they're handed also a copy of the practice handbook. But the practice handbook, within the first two to three pages, set out what the business is, that you are now, once you've passed your probationary period, et cetera, et cetera, an owner of this business, that the business sets out these three core values, that the governance of the business is ultimately the operations board reporting to the trustees. The trustees are members of the profession, person X, Y, and Z, and so forth. So you know, if you can imagine, you're a part one straight out of college and you're handed this you know, practice handbook and it talks then about you know, CAD standards and all that sort of stuff. So far, so good. But the first few pages set out the whole philosophy of the studio and the business that you are just about to join. And I, I think that's a really compelling and strong thing in that there's no ambiguity that this is an exciting journey for any staff member in that you, know, you can sit in the interview and you know, people like myself or James can talk with enthusiasm, hopefully, and excitement about the business people are about to join. But when you see it black and white in front of you in this document that you're given and you know you, you suddenly know that you're joining somewhere a little bit unusual and special you know? I think I think the other thing is that um, it helps remind everybody um, you know the core whatever we do in this business and, 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 and the, the direction that we take the practice we've got to come back to those core principles and and assess whether or not we are adhering to them. So, 
you know, if we were to open an office in another part of the UK or abroad, for instance, you know, are we are we fulfilling the the ambitions and the core values that we set ourselves at the very beginning in doing so? You know, and and if we're not, then we have to raise the question: well, Why are we doing it? Mm. Um, so, I think there are helpful grounding mechanism to to actually um, question the decisions that you make as, as a practice, as directors, as a trustee board. And, and we come back to them on a regular basis to say, you know, is this key decision that we're going to make, which is going to influence, you know, people's lives and careers, is it adhering to what we set out to do at the very beginning? Um, now, you know, and, and I, I think it's a really good basis of, of testing the validity of, of our strategy. Mm -hmm. It enables us to even explore issues of scale. How big a studio ultimately do you want to be? Um, you know, and if you go back to the core values, which is about nurturing design, creativity, being a family of individuals who know each other, who work together and trust each other, it, it almost begins to underpin. Could you do that with a studio that ultimately grew to 200? Mm -hmm. I would venture probably not from having spoken to brilliant owners of studios at 200. Where is this sweet spot for sharing and everybody knowing and trusting each other? And you begin to establish pretty quickly scale. Yeah. You know, and, and us, you know, the scale of the studio could be somewhere between where we are now, sort of knocking on the door of 50 staff members, up to 60, 70, but probably no more yeah. before you become this yielding beast that's just too big. And suddenly, if you've got teams working on things, they don't have that interaction with other colleagues because you're in two premises or you're on different floors of that premises and so forth. So in a sense, these become these core values, the guidance for what we're trying to achieve from a business perspective as well and how you manage such questions as growth, which clients and sectors you wish to pursue, the key issue of succession and people's careers and so forth. So um, it's a really important thing and I really enjoy that it only runs to a few pages. It's not war and peace. And then it's good to keep referencing back to as that sort of... Um, you know, the walking stick that you hold on to continuously yeah. to you're treading the right path. Yeah, love it. Yeah, like, like the guiding star almost kind of. <laughs> exactly right. And, um, you know, I, there's a phrase which I use a lot, which is pith. I, I really enjoy the fact that we managed to do that thing which architects aren't very good at, which is to edit and to bring it from being 40 pages all the way down to a few compelling pages. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Um, to move on a little bit, um, how does the apprenticeship scheme work at APT? And ha was that something that grew out of the constitution and the core values? Perhaps you could t tell us a little bit about how it works, what it is. Um, well, if I can just start about why, why, why did we get involved in the apprenticeship scheme? I think, I think you know, we recognise that architecture as an industry um, is incredibly challenging to get into. Um, I don't think, or we don't believe that, that, that it's, uh, it, it can be somewhat prohibitive for, for certain people. Um, and it's, it's, it's not a particularly sort of, um, I think it's getting better, but I think there is, there, there is a, a need to make the, the profession more diverse. Um, and if one can imagine going through architecture school and the just the, the financial cost involved with uh, studying architecture as a starting point, um, and yes, we know that there are student loans out there, and 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 but, but fundamentally, you come out of that journey with a huge amount of debt into a job which, when you're a junior member of staff, is not particularly well paid. And so there is this 
um, you know, it, 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 it's somewhat off-putting, I suspect, for a lot of people to, to get into architecture from a financial perspective alone, let alone for other reasons, but, but, but you know, th that it can be financially prohibitive. And so, um, you know, we wanted to see whether or not we could get ourselves involved in a program that, that may, you know, could change that. Mm. Um, so Jason um, has a friend and longstanding colleague um, who he was in discussion with, who was involved in the program. And perhaps you like to sort of expand on your yeah, I mean, experience with Glenn. Like, <laughs> like all great ideas, this, this idea grew from a, a boozy evening of rant, um, which is, I mean, I'm sort of involved and have been involved in architectural education, tutoring and visiting and all of that sort of thing. And I sat with some dear friends, both within and outside of uh, the architectural, uh, architectural world, the creative world, and was really just talking about the student experience and a little bit of inherent frustration and that wider question, if I could, would I, and if I was on that journey, would I, and yeah, would you become an architect now if you knew what you knew and would you enter the profession as an 18-year-old? All of those sorts of conversations. And I guess over a glass too many red or whatever it was, I sort of said that you know, it feels broken. It doesn't feel inclusive. It doesn't feel <clears throat> like it's a journey. If like me, you're just from a working class background in country and, you know, when I went into architecture, there were grants and there were all these other ways of encouraging you to embark on this really fantastic journey. Mm -hmm. And it just doesn't feel like that anymore. So here I was, I said my piece and it was probably very inarticulate, but those around me sort of said, well, what are you doing? Why are you regaling against the apparatus that he is? You have with the business that is apt, the constitution, the way the app is set up, a way to facilitate change here. Do something about it rather than moaning was basically what was said. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was quite an eye opener. You know, we're great at moaning, all of us, but to facilitate change takes a bit of courage. And I think that this is what I really love about this studio and the business that is apt. I came and I sat with colleagues, with the platform group, with the trustees, and so I said, is there something that we can do here? I just wonder. And everybody said, yes, 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 yes. We don't know what it is, but let's go exploring that together. So we asked uh, a friend, who is rather brilliant at lifting stones and uncovering solutions, who set off on a journey, who set off on a journey as to what does architectural education mean? Are there alternatives to the standard model? And there were alternatives, many alternatives, but a rather hidden secret was the RVA-sponsored, government-backed apprenticeship mm -hmm. process. And once you started asking the right questions and knowing where to look, there was brilliant help available. I think the biggest frustration, however, is that you need to know the questions and you need to know where to look to find that help. But once we went on that journey and found that help, what a journey it was. And um, we worked with the RBA and we worked with London South Bank University. And over a period of time that began from November in 2020 to National Apprenticeship Week, I remember it well, I think it was the 6th of February, 2021, we launched the APT Apprenticeship. Uh, we launched it at the start of Apprenticeship Week. We spoke to local sixth form colleges here, community colleges, the Sutton Trust, many others about APT undertaking a fully funded apprenticeship program to find an apprenticeship to come and join us 
for that apprenticeship to find their way through with London South Bank University, achieving a degree at the end of it, hmm. but actually during that process, being a member of staff with the business, having the support of the business, and ultimately, at the end of it, not being in debt, hmm. earning a good London wage, yep. having the support of the apt business behind them, but also at the end of it, rather than exiting, as James and I did, the educational process where you've got a degree, but you've never done a single day in a studio, our apprentices will have spent four days every week in the studio. Can you imagine how good they're going to be at the end of their degree, yeah. at the end of their master's? I mean, this is the future of the apt project as we saw it. You know, yeah. these, these are the next studio leaders, the next exec directors and so forth. So this is the enthusiasm. You know, once we asked the question, can we? And then we found friends to help us to achieve. We set off. We interviewed. We advertised. We had a wonderful response. <clears throat> we then spent time talking to brilliant A-level candidates, working with them, talking with their parents, and eventually we narrowed our apprentices down. And we went with the ambition of finding one apprentice. Mm -hmm. And we had such great candidates, we just couldn't decide. Yep. And then we went back to London South Bank University and said, we know there's only 30 places across the whole country for an apprenticeship program. Could we be greedy enough to maybe have two? And can we fund two? And can we bring two into the app business? Yeah. Um, they supported us. They said yes. And now we have two apprentices with us, Holly and Angel, who've been with us since August. Yep. And uh, gosh, they're scarily good. And it's just fantastic how much energy they bring, how quickly they're learning, but as well, how well they're doing within the standard architectural education. Mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're on their day release. They're working with full-time architectural students doing a degree. But they're sort of, they're right there at the forefront of the debate going on because they're seeing what goes on in an architectural studio four days a week. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just think it's... Uh, a fabulous program, but it has to be the future or part of the future, surely, in that, you know, these have to be the sort of alternative journeys yeah. that must be supporting here. I mean, coming out of education, £100,000 in debt, you know, one of the world's most expensive cities, that's not sustainable, surely. And it also means that, where is that diversity? Where are those who can't afford that finding a way to join the education that is that of an architect? Yeah. So that's the journey we went on. We're thrilled with how it is progressing. And, um, well, it's sort of watch this space, really. You know, we, uh, we sort of feel that it's really, again, part of the business that is apt and what makes the studio a little bit special and unusual. Well, what would be your advice for other businesses to engage or to start their own apprenticeship schemes? Because and I think, you know, you're quite right. This needs to be the the future. It opens up so many doors and possibilities for people and for diversity, you know, for diversity within the profession. Um, everybody wins, really. But obviously there's some logistical constraints around it, um, you know, like being able to, to, to scale if there's in the in the country, if there's only 30 places that's quite a small number yeah i mean i, I think um it's it, so it's a it's a four-year commitment mm -hmm. so the, the course the, the the two ladies that jason has just mentioned they're on a, they're on a four-year course and we're, we're we're committed to that um so i think the, the first question for any practice is is you know are you prepared to commit for that amount of time? Because for small practices, that can be quite a daunting prospect, one can yeah. imagine. Um, you know, the industry, as we've already discussed, can be <clears throat> up and down. And so, 
you've got to be able to maintain stability throughout that period, sufficient stability. The other thing is, um, can you afford to nurture them in the correct way? And have you got a structure that enables you to do that? Mm. So prior to the apprenticeship program, we ran an annual internship program here at ACT where we had work experience students, similar sort of age coming from college or GCSE level. Um, so sort of students that were 16 to 18 mm -hmm. coming working for a period of time over the summer um, just to get some work experience. And the way that we set that up was to have our part ones and our part twos engaged in that mentoring program and for anybody coming to do work experience, for them to have direct access to those people that could help them and advise them and give them time. And so we, we sort of had a bit of a dummy run with that yeah. program. Yes, we did, yeah. <clears throat> and, and, and I guess with the apprentices, it, it's about ensuring that they have got some mentors direct mentors within the studio, and that, that, that you can afford the time to help them grow their skill sets, expand their knowledge, and take the time to show them things and how things are done in, the, in a correct way. Um, and also perhaps be that sounding board for their college work as well, to give them advice, to give them um, uh, feedback, um, and to be able to give them a mixed and diverse range of experience. You know, it's no point in, in bringing in apprentices if, if, you know, you see it as a way of cheap labour and you can put them on, you know, stair and toilet packages for the next four years and, and that, you, you know, you're not entering it in the right spirit. You yeah. have to go into it with the notion that you're going to gradually grow each of their skill sets um, and you have to accept that they're not going to be, you know, they're not going to be working on projects for you, um, particularly at the outset. You know, to, it, they need time to grow, to 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 evolve their skills. Um, and yes, I think you know, after twelve months, I'm sure that we will, will we will see their working time being more, um, you know, they'll make more of a contribution. But actually. You know, in our minds, we've said 12 months, but they're already showing it. I mean, crikey, after two months, they were, they are so driven and so talented. We're struggling to keep them. <coughs> that, 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 that we can't give them enough to do. So, um, and I think for anybody embarking on that journey, they have to be prepared to, to look at it in, in that way. Um, but it's also, <clears throat> I mean, we're getting right the way back to almost day one here of the ed education of an architect. And I think that's quite, that, that's the exciting thing for, you know, somebody like myself. Um, the profession has changed so much. It is so focused on tech and CAD and, you know, all of that sort of thing. <clears throat> here we are, this particular journey began in August with our apprentices. You know, it was sort of four months and counting. But they've spent a lot of time in the model shop. Mm -hmm. They've spent a lot of time sketching and learning how to draw beautifully. And goodness, they can draw beautifully already before they joined us. And, and those are sort of core values, which if you're straight into the architectural educational system, you tend to forget or don't get taught these days. And there's sort of a paternal role, I think, in mm -hmm. by going back to Genesis here, you know, some of those core skills that seem to have been a little bit waylaid of late yeah. can actually become part of the re-education of an architect. And, it's, uh, it, it, it's, 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 it's really fantastic as well because you, you're really creating highly employable people. Well, well, you know, we come back to this phrase, you know, sort of length of tenure within the studio, succession and so forth. You mm -hmm. know, we... We enter this particular journey really hoping that you know, why shouldn't our 18-year-old apprentices be the next leaders of this studio in due yep. course? And, um, and that would be a true testament to the structure of the EOT, really. Mm -hmm. 
Um, in terms of what is prohibitive to this process, it is all a little bit secretive. You know, you have to go looking for it. Of course you do. I mean, what, why would the educational establishment wish to sort of hold a flag to there are alternatives? There will always be the standard university way of dealing with things. But only 30 or 40 placements for apprentices within the world of architecture per year is clearly not good enough. And we have so many friends within the world of architecture. This has really piqued their curiosity. And I think if we can get other studios talking about apprenticeships, if we can put a little bit of pressure onto the ROBA, who I must say have been incredibly supportive and helpful, mm -hmm. If we can begin to create a little bit of noise around this, why can there not be 80 apprenticeship placements in two years and then 200 and so forth and so forth? And eventually that famous phrase, you know, small acorns, great things will happen. Um, yeah. so, so we're enjoying this one and we feel quite privileged that, you know, we've got two of these brilliantly talented people within our business. Brilliant. What's the plan moving forward for 2022, both with the apprenticeship scheme, are you looking to take on more people or expand it? Or um, we, we were greedy in the, or indecisive. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, we went in with our eyes open, one into the business and two arrived. And, they're, and it's working very well because they're supporting each other. Mm -hmm. uh, we're taking a year off this year. We are making sure that we don't overreach yep. and that our tickets is bed in. And I think we'll come back to this and try and bring a couple of additional apprentices in or at least one more, maybe in the next year or so. This is certainly, we don't feel a one-off process, but we'll find the right moment and the right way to expand and move forward on this. Um, in terms of the year ahead, I mean, it's a very exciting year for us. I mean, we spent a lot of time within this conversation talking about some of the things that the studio is so proud of, ownership and governance and apprentices and transparency. Um, you know, another thing that we really, really thrive on is our client relationships and the creative process. Um, you know, this isn't just a well-round business. It's a business that really strives to do exceptional design and I think 2022 will be a great year for us in the delivery of some of our projects we have a number of wonderful projects on site which will near completion we had a couple of projects last year which completed which we're very proud of we've got projects coming through in all stages you know sort of those fledgling sort of feasibility is all the way through to the rough and tough of being on site and the on-site journey. So I think 2022 for us is going to be a wonderful year. Um, the last couple of years, they've been tough, just like yeah. everybody. Um, you know, we've, we've had years, well, last year, case in point, a lot of projects went on hold. They were not lost. They were just put on hold for a little while. We then won more business last year than we've ever won, won um, which we're so pleased with. But actually, we've almost lost the ability to celebrate because ultimately what was happening, the winning of new business was keeping the studio alive and fed with creativity and income and new clients and excitement. And you sort of forget to celebrate those successes yeah. as you move to what is the next project and where is it coming from? What we're finding this year and the, um, the busyness of the business this year is that a lot of those projects that were on hold last year have been re-energized and are coming back. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very exciting time. I think also we, um, in the last year or so, we've, we've invested a lot in um, new business initiatives and, you know, I, I, I see this as a question that comes up on a lot of architecture forums, you know, how do, how do you go about winning new business? And we've always um, 
you know, we've, we've taken immense pride in the fact that we build long-standing client relationships here. Mm-hmm. I think that that's because we give our clients, you know, an excellent service. They, 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 they enjoy our design process. Um, and I, I think we're, we're good people to work with, you know, that we listen to our clients and we understand and we try to, you know, really try to take on board um, what they're trying to achieve as well as what we're trying to achieve creatively. And, and traditionally, we've had a lot of repeat business as, as a result of that, which is tremendous. But I think in the last year or so, we've actually put a lot more into expanding those relationships into new relationships and finding people that have similar principles and, and, and ideas that we do. And, and we're finding that the people that we're talking to are enjoying, you know, coming to our studio and seeing how we work, the processes that we go through. Um, it, it's not just about showing your portfolio. It's, yeah. it's, it's everything that goes with it. And, and you'll be surprised that, you, you know, how conversations can really lead to some really exciting opportunities. Um, and that's something that we're going to keep doing. I think, um, I think the phrases studios don't use enough are fun and energy. And I find energizing about where we are in our business cycle is that, you know, people have been with the business a long time, myself and Robin. You know, I don't think we've ever been more energized and excited by the current portfolio, the clients, and the opportunities. Um, you know, and that, 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 that's a rather splendid and special thing, quite honestly, in that you, you can get to a sort of age and you, you, it feels as exciting as when you entered the industry at the age of 18 or 21. And, um, and I think that's sort of that drive and the idea that every day is problem solving, yeah. finding creative solutions to really exciting client-led ideas is, 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 is I, I just find that sort of, you know, it's easy to get out of bed in the morning when you've got those sorts of things to address each day. You know, and I, you know my, my dear friend Robin, we've known each other all these years, I don't think I've ever seen him so energized and excited, quite honestly, about some of the things that he is currently involved with. Um, again, it's quite exciting that as a business can mature, as you can deal with those issues of succession and growth and people moving their way through a business and ultimately getting to you know, managing and looking after the governance of a business, that individuals can then look towards their repositioning within that business and how ultimately it can be an exciting thing. And I think that's something that we've done in the last 12 months as well within this business, which is find people's skill sets and the location on the pitch in the right position. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's rather, it's rather exciting. You know, we, we can't all be centre forwards. You know, it's it's really good that your repositioned location is. I'm going to be a left back, and I'm going to really be uh, you know, very, very sort of uh, happy, energised, and the best possible stopper Brilliant. in that left position. And you know, I don't wish to sort of pursue that metaphor, but you know, that's that's what we're enjoying about um, some of the things that the structure has enabled us to do. Um, but I do come back to, you know, creativity is at the heart of what we are doing. Design, the design-led process, design reviews, you know, that's the fun stuff. And that's the fun stuff that I think we've refocused on and absolutely brought back into, uh, you know, what are the business's priorities. Love it. Um, spoke of our relationships. We are so privileged to have a set of clients that keep working and wanting to work with the business. Um, They are brilliant clients. They are brilliant projects. But then if I shine a mirror on ourselves, we must be doing something right. I would suggest that they want to keep working with the apt business. Brilliant. Thank you very much. That's the perfect place to conclude the conversation. 
And uh, thank you, James and Jason, for sharing with us that your insights of, of around apps, your expertise, um, and the powerful business structures that you have, have developed. So thank you very much. Our absolute pleasure. Thank, thank you, you very so much for having us. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.